Joining us today and on Thursday, I'm very pleased to say we have Mick Morrison, who is a serving RAF officer and a volunteer at the Erskine Veterans Charity as well. And he's also going to tell us a bit more about the uh, American Friends of Erskine Hospital, which uh, you're probably familiar with. And if you're not, um, you will be through the course of this week as uh, we speak to Mick, who joins us now. And uh, welcome along, Mick. Great to have you with us. Tell us a little bit about your background, because you have been in the armed forces for quite a long time now haven't you and uh, it wasn't always the RAF it was uh, it was the navy to begin with correct yes yes um so come january the 6th um i will be 20 years in the air force um and i did exactly 10 years to the day in the royal navy on the 6th of january 1992 i joined the navy yeah Wow. Okay. And what's your general background then? Because being involved in the the armed forces for for such a long time, what was the the story of you before that? Uh, whereabouts in Scotland are you from, and and how did you find your way into into the armed forces? Well, um, I I'm from Glasgow, and um, way back in when I left school, um, I wanted to be a, an electrician, and there was few apprenticeships about then um, and it didn't work out so I wasn't able to get there and with that and then in between times I did various things but I kind of had an idea that I'd you know in the meantime to join the police force but I needed a little bit of experience I believe so I approached the careers office in Glasgow and at 20 and a half years of age I joined the Royal Navy as an able seaman or as a seaman at that time and became an able seaman on Mine warfare vessels. Um, my first ship was HMS Middleton over at Resyth, and I did two years on there from August '92 to August '94. Wow. Okay. So you, you really to give you the, the the trades, I suppose, as well that you were you were you were seeking. And and did you envisage that you would be in the armed forces for so long when you first joined up? <laughs> no, to be honest. Um, I, I, I didn't, uh, and I probably, I probably wouldn't have been still in the forces. However, um, I ended up, uh, I ended up flying in the Royal Navy as a, a Royal Navy uh, air crewman on Sea King helicopters, and I started, I started down that route, actually um, about, around 1994, and by the time that I had applied within, uh, done the training, um, it was around 1997, 1990, the end of 96, 97, where I ended up as a qualified uh, air crewman on Sea Kings, uh, being based at 819 Squadron down at Presswick, uh, near uh, HMS Gannock, yeah, 1997. And w- before you moved on to the, the Air Force then, where where did your, your Navy career take you around the world? Well... Once I had did my uh, two years on HMS Middleton at Resyth, um, I went over to Faz Lane in a shore job, and it was during that time that I went down to Cold Rose and back for for the aptitude tests. Uh, I was successful, and I moved straight from Resyth down to uh, RNAS Cold Rose down in Cornwall, and I did my training down there, um, predominantly on 810 Squadron. And then I moved directly from there back up or back up to Scotland to 819 Squadron at Prestwick, where I remained there until I joined the Air Force. Um, so during that time, I mean, done, I did a, a global tour on, um, on NTG Naval Task Group 2000. And in the year 2000, it was just over seven months, I think, if I remember right. And uh, we did an east to west or back from the west global trip on Fort Victoria. Um, with a with three helicopters, so that was fairly interesting. Done numerous exercises. I've been to the states. Um, uh, you know, I've, I've been quite 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 a number of places. In particular, that global trip took me to some places that I would that I would never have never have been um, in my life. So it did give me a, a tremendous opportunity. And then you moved over to the the RAF as well, which um, obviously you've you've got that experience of flying in the navy. But I suppose a a natural progression in a way but what was the what did that bring you that, that the navy didn't yeah well the thing was that um the way that my career was going i would have had to have moved down to cold rose again um if i was looking at promotion etc and although i was on sea king helicopters um uh, my my 
fundamental, my primary role in the Sea King was anti-submarine warfare. Um, so I was able to transfer that skill from a rotary wing platform to a fixed wing platform. Um, that's the reason why I approached the Air Force. Um, so I basically went to the careers office in the Air Force and um, asked them if they would be willing to have me based on my background and they said yes. So I basically... Uh, it was all above board. Um, I approached the Navy to see if I could be released and they said yes and then the Air Force wanted me so I just went through the same process as anybody else would um, to, to get in um, the same aptitude test and um, I was successful. Uh, I did a bespoke course down at um, Cranwell uh, before moving to Kinloss. Uh, RAF Kinloss, uh, where the uh, Nimrods were based, and I spent a number of years up there. Now, the Nimrods, um, I seem to remember in my dim, distant past of being in the Air Cadets, um, that, that uh, some people told me that flew on them, that they, were, they could be quite a sickly experience. Is that, is that right? Actually, yeah. You, the, you're right there. Um, they apparently... Um, although I could never prove it, <laughs> um, they had they had a kind of corkscrew effect as they yeah. flew through the air. But they, I don't know whether that was entirely the case. I think the reason why um, Nimrods were um, had 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 the label of you know an aircraft that you would go on and be and sick on is because we flew them pretty low level, um, and we would keep, kind of throw them about a bit when we were doing ASW. So. The, yeah, we we had our work cut out for us when we were doing low level ASW, and if the weather was pretty poor, it'd be pretty bumpy. So yeah, um, yeah, yeah. So any of the flying passenger wise, uh, it wasn't uncommon for them to be uh, in the galley area and not in the toilet area, um, being sick into a sick bag. <laughs> <laughs> in particular, the air cadets. I did feel sorry for them at times. Yeah, yeah <laughs> I seem to remember that. I think we went on a flight. I think it was in a. It was in a jet stream because where I yeah. where I was in the air cadets, we were near um, Finningley yes. at the time, uh, near Doncaster, and they had a, a squadron there where they were they were learning how to fly um, jet streams so that they could do either move eventually onto Nimrods or I think it yeah. was Hercules and things like that. And I remember we were in. Um, it's coming back to me now, thinking about it. We were on this flight, and the the guy was saying, you know, this seems a bit bumpy, but you want to be on a you want to be on a Nimrod if yeah. you want <laughs> if you yeah, want the yeah. real. And I suppose what didn't help. Was the smell of the us cooking stuff in the oven, and we were, <laughs> <laughs> we were getting tore into all the uh, rations that we were getting. And they, the last thing that they were wanting was anything to eat. And of course, we were just getting on with it as normal, you know. <laughs> <laughs> so it was pretty funny. I did, I genuinely did feel sorry for them at, at times. Um, thankfully, I've never suffered from ear sickness, so uh, yeah. Uh, <laughs> like, and, and as well, you know, the new aircraft that I'm on, the P8, the Poseidon. Um, that that's as smooth as anything so yeah we, we don't really have the problems anymore thankfully yeah i was going to say the nimrods are finished now haven't they but you've you just yeah. alluded there that you've got new uh, replacements now and that's what you're 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 flying in now which i think they're, they're like 737s effectively is that as yeah, yeah. E exactly yeah they are 737s and uh, they've been ripped out inside uh, and filled with our kit you know and even even we are kit on them, there's actually quite a lot of room on them, and there's only eight of a crew, so that's our kind of minimum crew that we have. So we can conduct a, a task with a our complement is eight, but uh, yeah, they're very they're they're very smooth and quiet, and we have the luxury of noise cancelling headphones and and um, you know the jet is as as normal as as you, as you as you would expect a, a seven three seventy B. So yeah, it's very comfortable. There's no hydraulic fluid and fuel and bits and pieces um, dripping down in us or or you know dripping from the aircraft as the old kind of military aircraft would have been. You know, coming from Sea Kings, you know, um, it was it was common to to have leaks and stuff. But we don't we don't ha we don't suffer from that just now. Um, or now with the uh, with the P8, so it's a nice place to be, if I'm honest. Yeah. And really, you're you so you're out there doing similar kind of patrols, are you? Um, maritime patrols and that that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. I mean, we're not we're not there yet with the uh, with the new aircraft, the new platform where we were with with the old one with the with the uh, with the Nimrod. Um, but we're getting there and we're progressing very quickly. We've got a tremendous amount of experience. In fact, the majority. I won't say what the average age is. Um, 
I don't know off the top of my head, but I would say that the average age for the crews that are up in 120 squadron just now, which is the uh, it's the first complemented uh, squadron with crews, um, an old squadron of mine, CXX. So um, yeah, there's I'd, I would imagine that the average age is over 40, but we're starting to get the ab initios in now, uh, the younger the younger people coming through. So that that's excellent, and they're the future of it really. So um, we've been able to, you know, utilise all of the, our experience on our previous platform, the Nimrod, and, and bring it on to, uh, onto the P8 Poseidon. Um, but we're not doing everything yet um, that we would have been expected to do with the old jet. But that's just a matter of time. Um, and we've already started um, in the short space of time that, that I've been involved, you know, which is in the last couple of years. Um, we've already started to provide um, ops cover, so cover for, for various um, uh, bits and pieces we might be asked to go and do, like and serve a notice period um, for, for getting airborne like through the weeks through the week and into the weekend. So we've already started that, so that's a big step for us, a big step. Let's look at your links to Erskine then, because being involved in the services for so long um, and, and obviously being based in, in Scotland, the Erskine Veterans Charity would be something that you're very much um, well aware of. And you're a, a volunteer at Erskine. What's your um, story with, with the charity? Yeah, um, I was working in the simulator up at Kinloss uh, when we were... You know the the plan was to have a replacement from for the uh, the Nimrod, and it was going to be the MRA four. And unfortunately, that the plans for that had been ongoing. Um, the decision was made to to cancel it, and so basically, we went into work one day. We were we didn't know really what was going to happen or whatever. And then it was formally announced. And um, excuse me, we were all looking at each other thinking what what we're we going to do so um i have always lived in glasgow so no matter where i was whether i was in Rosyth or Faz lane or cold rose courses through cranwell courses in within the uk or in my period of time um at kinloss and now Lossiemouth, i've always lived in glasgow and i've always commuted so you know the general idea was uh up my sunday for a monday or round about then and go back towards the end of the week, uh, sometimes staying over. But um, so I was kind of in a unique position because most of the people up there were living up there. So they were going home at night. And of course, the flying kind of stopped pretty quickly. You know, the simulator work stopped pretty quickly. So we were kind of left, not with nothing to do, but we were certainly looking for things to do, you know, to, to fill some of our time. and. I had heard about Erskine through a guy that I was in the Air Force with and I basically just made a phone call to them and, and, and got to speak to the, the gentleman that was that was uh, dealing with volunteers and I just explained the situation and asked him if he'd be interested and he says absolutely, we set up a meeting. A couple of weeks later I had spoke to my work and he said yes, told him it was you know a charity founded in 1916 uh, for Scott, for, for uh, uh, veterans in Scotland and I would like to go down and, and help them if I could you know in the meantime and of course I went down had an interview uh, was showed around the place and one of the places that I went to within Erskine I was showed was the uh, fundraising department and immediately that I was uh, introduced to Sarah Bannerman who who is still the head of uh, fundraising and external communications I believe is a formal role uh, title um, she just went right. I'm going to have you. So because I was serving at that time, and and it started from there. So that was 2010, I think. Yeah. So over okay. 10 years ago. Yeah. Fantastic. And um, the Erskine Reed McEwen Activity Centre is is something that we hear a lot about, and we, we've spoken to uh, various people who have been involved in in Ermac over the the time and and that's something that you've been involved in as well yeah yeah i mean i've i've been involved um with air mac you know i've visited a few times um and then when the restrictions uh, uh due to the covid covid19 um started i had a bit of time in my hands and i was able to i was able to uh 
participate on their online uh, Teams meetings, um, as in the the, the 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 gentlemen and ladies that were involved um, uh, with Airmac um, in the community, we were getting together a couple of times a week, so I was able to partake in some of their some of their chat and get involved and get to know a few of them, um, and it's a tremendous thing because. It, there's a lot of people that don't need to be actually in Erskine living. They need support, you know, on a, a daily basis or a, even just a weekly basis where they, they have a mode of transport, they can get the bus or whatever, but it's nice for them to come in and, and be amongst, you know, a group of people of similar mindsets to them, you know. Um, the banter is pretty interesting, if I'm honest. <laughs> um, yeah, 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 because uh, I get, you know, I get it. I get a lot of banter from them because I, apparently I don't do much work because I'm in the Air Force and apparently <laughs> I don't do any work because I'm Air Crew. So, yeah, yeah. So uh, I just remind them that I outrank most of them so uh, they better watch themselves. But, yeah, it's, it's a tremendous idea and I see it as, as the future. Uh, a big part of the future of Erskine itself um, is being able to support people in the community. Um, uh, yeah. I've always thought that veterans, including, you know, my idea of a veteran was somebody someone from the war, you know, from bygone days of of the wars, like World War Two, for example, and it's not, you know, there's a lot of young people out there that are that are veterans that, you know, they don't need support um, on a daily basis, but it's just nice for them to be involved in the environment and, as I said, the mindset. Yeah, so it's a tremendous idea, uh, and I, I think I, I think it's, a, it's something that I would certainly support. Um, um, uh, if they, they were looking for any any help or whatever, yeah, absolutely. And I think the the, the big thing about it is, of course, that it, as you say, this is not just something f- f- uh, for people to do who are residents at Erskine, but anybody who's ex service or uh, or what have you from from the local area or even further afield. Sometimes uh, welcome to come down for a bit. And, uh, you know, just, and I think that's the thing, isn't it? That You mentioned that banter. That's the one thing that the people that we've spoken to who do use Ermac regularly, uh, like we spoke to Stevie Wiley a little while ago, who's, uh, you know, one of the regulars down at, at, at Ermac. And, and it is that that banter, that, you know, stuff that you, you the everyday stuff, I suppose, that you, you maybe don't fully appreciate when you're in the armed forces, but it's one of the first things that you start to miss if, you, if you're not there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean... Um, whether I like it or whether I don't, you know, thirty years service is 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 go, it's going to shape me in one way or another. You know, um, I like to think that it, it rounded me in a lot of ways. You know, and for the good. And um, Stevie in particular, I know Stevie, and um, I don't know if he still does it. I'm assuming that he does, uh, but he they, they do a, a publication. I yeah. can't remember how often it comes out. Um, I've not heard Stevie's um, interview. But any time that I've went down there, he's been there working away tirelessly on this publication. And I, I, it's a great thing, you know, and it keeps, you know, it's a personal thing and it keeps um, the people that want to be, uh, you know, have links to their, their, their past from a, an armed forces perspective. It, 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 it gives them that opportunity. You know, there's, there's, they do work, woodworking classes, they, they sell some of this stuff. Um, they do the painting, etc. There's a pool table down there. They, they can go, go down and get a bit of lunch. They can have cu- cups of tea and coffee. Uh, it is really, really fantastic. There's no two ways about it. I was genuinely impressed with uh, Airmac, and we've supported them. I think you're going to touch on it from the American friends. Yeah. Of Erskine Hospital side, we, we, we've supported them um, and um, are looking to do in the future as well, although... Uh, discussions have had still to take place and exactly what we're going to do um, but yeah absolutely it's it's tremendous Mick you are involved in that side of things in the uh, American Friends of, of Erskine Hospital but I want you to tell us the story about how it came about first because it does have links with I would say arguably Scotland's biggest ever movie star um, tell us about how it came about and 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 the origins and, and how Hollywood was perhaps involved if memory serves correct, it, 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 this happened before a few years uh, before I my involvement with Erskine. So over ten years ago, there was a there was a, a chief exec there, Jim Panton, I think Jim's name was. He got involved with uh, a, a society over in America, 
uh, and there was an event, I think Sean Connery was there and Sean Connery's agent. Um, and the link started there and through, through, that, through that connection, uh, um, we, or sorry, Erskine um, at the time got links to uh, the Caledonian Club in San Francisco and they hit it off and one thing and another back and forward. Um, I think it was, at the time, I'm, I'm pretty sure it was uh, Davy Scott who was the, uh, who was the, uh, who was the, um, the, the chief of the, uh, the Caledonian Club in, in San Francisco. And it just built from there, the foundations built from there. And there was, they, they have a games in California over in San Francisco. Um, or near San Francisco in a place called Pleasanton is where, where the games take place. It's a huge, a huge event, it happens every year and there's thousands of people go to it. And the, oh, Erskine had already went there um, and, and fundraised before I was involved. And that's where the link then started. Uh, and then it was formalized. So although American Friends of Erskine Hospital carry the Erskine name, they're, for want of a better way of putting it, they're legally independent, but mm. they're basically um, the American side of Erskine itself and are supported by Erskine back home, as we like to call them, the mothership. And um, American Friends is something that's covered at the, uh, the board meetings at Erskine itself and what we're doing, and um, we get feedback from them. So that's where the link started, just briefly, I became involved just after, I mean, it, I think it was 2011, the first I get involved with American Friends. And so I did hear that right then, Sean Connery was was involved in some way, I mean, at least just planting the seed. That's right, but that was for, a, a, off the top of my head, it was something to do with kilts, I can't remember, funnily <laughs> right. enough, <laughs> and it was called something like that, but... Um, I just remembered as I was speaking to you there that there, there was an event that happened, I think it was over in New York City, and um, Sean Connery was at that, or his agent was at it, or both, and through that contact with his agent, um, it, 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 there was a connection made with the Caledonian Club in San Francisco. I can't on, honestly mm. remember, but it was something something like that, and that's where, that's where, it, where, it, where it began. That was the, the early early days of American Friends. Wow. So maybe some some small part uh, played by, by Sean Connery. It could, um, yeah. the, certainly the conversation began uh, as a result of, of, of the two, well, him or I, his agent or something I don't like know ex- that. I don't know in exactly the capacity, but certainly mm. Sean Connery, I can say categorically, he was involved. But whether he was knowingly involved, but had, there was a connection there with Sean Connery, definitely. So when we speak about the American Friends of, of Erskine, um, Despite obviously being uh, uh, many thousands of miles away from the Erskine Hospital and, and the Erskine Homes across Scotland, there has been a lot of fundraising going on, and there's some key supporters and, and groups of supporters who get together to um, fund the work and help continue the fantastic care that, that goes on at the Erskine Hospital. Tell us more about some of the things that have gone on and some of some of the groups involved. Yeah, well, the, the first group that was involved was the, um, I, I think I've mentioned them, is the uh, Caledonian Club of San Francisco and the games that they have in September around the Labor Day weekend um, um, where they open up the fairgrounds down there and um, they, we make our way over. Um, I've had the privilege of attending the games, I think first time in 2011. Uh, and I've been there maybe four times, maybe five times, and I practically know everybody by name now. Um, uh, and 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 the Caledonian Club uh, group, um, and they during the games they get they give us a, a, a place in one of the uh, one of the buildings, uh, air conditioned centre stage, and we fundraise for Erskine and. It is tremendous. The, um, the public that come in that, that look for us every year, take part in a raffle. We always bring stuff over with us, you know, uh, unique bottles of whiskey, etc. And we fundraise over there over the, uh, well, the, the games are over two days, but it's it's basically from the start to finish, from the Thursday through to the uh, the Sunday, it's fundraising and attending events, various events. Um, and... So primarily it's the Caledonian Club of San Francisco 
And um, now we have the uh, St. Andrew Society of San Francisco. Um, they are big supporters of, of us as well. And they come and, and, and help us out and come and see us. And um, yeah, so that's our main links. And over the years we've been supporting Erskine. Um, the first thing that the Erskine approached us and asked us if we would like to fundraise for, um, they needed a new minibus. And um, we bought a brand new minibus uh, custom built for the veterans um, down in, in, in Erskine, uh, the main home, uh, Bishopton. And uh, up until that point, there, there were residents in Erskine that basically couldn't get out and about because they didn't have the transportation available for them. But that minibus was custom built so that they could get out. And um, that was a real eye-opener to be honest with you, and it wasn't that long ago. Um, so that was the first thing that we did. And then the second thing that we did with, with, you know, with the support of, of the uh, Caledonian Club, and particularly in the St Andrews Society, um, uh, we got another minibus, so we bought, we bought two. So they are running about Scotland just now, or around Glasgow, um, uh, with the, uh, the logos of the Caledonian Club and the St Andrews Society of uh, San Francisco on them. Um, so primarily down to them and uh, the, uh, the public over uh, in the states that, that attend the games. So it's been great. Yeah, yeah. It's fantastic stuff. It's absolutely fantastic and real, you know, strong support as well for many of which have, have not necessarily actually been to the to, to the location at Erskine themselves. But, you know, they're still um, putting in a huge amount of, of work to support this charity. Yeah, that's right. Um, we take over, uh, Sarah and her team um, put together a video and we take it over and we we have a, an event before the game start uh, on the Friday evening and we invite all the uh, key players and uh, of the club and uh, th- their guests as VIPs and we, uh, we show them the video, we update them on what Erskine's doing and um, we encourage them to visit. I know it's been difficult over the last year or so, um, but we have had visitors from the club over and uh, they get given the tour and they, then they get an idea of just how, how big Erskine is and how, how good it is. And um, I like to tell them that probably without exception, it's the, some of the best care that anybody can receive um, across the board. Um, so, and they, they're helping to they're helping to, to, to fundraise and support that. So yeah, we encourage people to come over and have a look, have the tour, but we like to give them as much information as possible and update them when, when we do go over, yeah. Finally, the, the importance of Erskine, um, to you personally, but also for for all servicemen, particularly those that are based in Scotland, I, I imagine, but I, I know that there's servicemen and women um, right across the whole of, of the country who uh, have um, had support from, from Erskine, be that a family member or, or directly or, 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 or how, however it may be, but the, the importance of the, of the Erskine Veterans Charity. Yeah, I mean... Um just touching back on the American Friends side, when we go over there, um, one thing that we are aware of is that the American forces have the VA, which is the Veterans Association, which I believe is which, which I believe is is government funded. Mm. And the surprise to them is when we tell them about Erskine back home uh, and veterans back home is they say, well, why do you need something like Erskine? And I say, well, we don't have something. Uh, such as a VA, we don't have that. Now there are there is support and networks uh, other than that, but specifically like the uh, Veterans Association, we don't have that. So in 1916, um, uh, Erskine Erskine was um, was was founded and uh, in support of of uh, veterans. Um, uh, back home here in Scotland, and it's not Scottish veterans, it's veterans in Scotland, so um, uh, there's plenty of people that have lived down south and now live up here. As long as they live in Scotland, they get the, they, they would get the support of Erskine, where they, where they could support. So that's mm. why it's important to have 
organisations like Erskine um, because the absence of, assist of the Veterans Association over here, the equivalent, um, uh, makes it, makes it um, uh, uh, how could I put it? it, it just makes it fundamental that, that, that we have something to support um, a unique group of people, to be honest. That's fantastic. Well, it's been great speaking with you, Mick, and thanks for joining us and telling us so much about y yourself, your experience um, that you're, you're currently having in, in the RAF and, uh, and, and the work going on at the Erskine Veterans Charity as well. Um, one final thing to ask you, um, for a, a, a song to, to play us out, please. Goodness me, um, <laughs> a song to play us out. Right, well, uh, I'm a big music fan, as most people are, right? Um, uh, I'm a big music fan, um, and I actually never gave it a great deal of thought, to be honest with you. Um, however, uh, I'm out of everybody that I like or have liked. Um, Prince is is the number one for me, and um, he's done many things. And one of his best known songs is obviously "Purple Rain," but I'm not going to suggest that one. I'm going to suggest a song that was just after Purple Rain uh, and it was called, or it is called Sometimes It Snows in April, okay, as Wonderful. an introduction for people to, uh, to Prince and to let them, let them hear what he's, uh, how diverse he can be and arguably for me one of the best um, 